And just tuning into your body, allow yourself to settle in. Add a little bit more water, or whatever you're doing is welcome. You need to do anything any different than you're doing. The beginning to bring awareness into your body. Allow your body to let you know if anything needs changing. Stand up, lie down. Lying down is my favorite posture for meditation. For some years now, maybe I've been saying five years for a while, so maybe I'm six or seven years now. Maybe five was right. 2017, 2018, something like that. Lying down, standing, sitting, whatever posture your body might be in. Finding some modicum of comfort and ease as much as is available. And maybe there's like just the hair available, you know? Like, this is life. This is uncomfortable sometimes. What if that wasn't a problem? And we didn't have to be in resistance to that, but rather kind of like, you know, like words surrender, you will find some more words, but like surrender to it. Oh, this is reality. I'm miserable, or I'm dripping in sweat, or I'm freezing cold, or my knee hurts, or my back hurts, or whatever reality is in this moment. What if we weren't fighting it? What if instead of fighting it, we were acknowledging it, or embracing it? Some way of allowing life to be as it is. Allowing life to be as it is. And if you want to explore lying down, I'll offer you a little bit of instruction that might be helpful. You want to take care that your back is comfortable. And so for some of us, that will mean putting our feet up on a coffee table or chair like our calves. For some of us, it means putting our feet flat on the floor or knees up to the sky or knees kind of landing in. Maybe it's legs totally extended and broad, feet turned out. But lying down, just as in standing or in sitting, we want to begin by creating comfort for ourselves as much as is possible, as much as is possible. And some of us have a greater disposition for falling asleep. And some of us don't have that much disposition in that direction. But if you do, it can be helpful to open the eyes and just gaze up at the ceiling or to bring the arms so that the upper arms are resting on the floor and the forearms are perpendicular to the floor with the fingers pointing to the ceiling as a way to help support wakefulness. And sometimes the mind is so busy, we don't need to worry about any of that. And we just practice getting comfortable. Feeling the support of the earth under our body, whatever our posture we're in, under our feet, in our seat, under our back, under our knees, through the furniture. Feeling the support of the earth, touching comfort, touching ease.
Noticing if there's anything in your body or in your environment that feels good or okay or good enough. Anything that you can attune to in your direct felt experience. Might be the support of the floor or the chair. It might be the arms resting on your lap. might be sound in your environment. And the sensation of breath in the body. Maybe, just maybe, the felt experience of the body settling, landing, arriving here, a moment of freedom. When we're dwelling here in the present moment. We can let go and rest, rest into now, oh, it's like this. And we feel the body resting, even just a little bit. Or something else that feels, emotionally feels pleasant. Okay, good enough. Hi there. You befriend that experience. Moments by moment, befriending ourselves befriending the unfolding, arising, the passing. Present, small thoughts begin and again. As often as we remember your path, your way, 
your practice. Experiencing the heart, mind, and body arriving moment by moment. Okay. Can we greet ourselves? Can we greet the moment just as it is? Even when it sucks. Oh. Oh, it's like this. And maybe you don't have anything sucky going on right now. Great. Celebrating that, cherishing that, savoring that, the absence of the suffering. Yes. Feel it. Broad and expansive. Freedom from suffering. Yes. Or maybe there is some dukkha, something that's other than as you would wish it to be. What happens if we don't fight the dukkha, but instead we embrace? The suffering, the unsatisfactoriness, tenderness, with love, with care, all oh. this is a moment of suffering. I got you. I'm here for you. Cultivating our ability to be here for ourselves. Because we're the only one who's really with ourselves 24 7. Might as well learn how to be here for ourselves. I am here for you. We might say to ourselves. I love you so much. How are you? What do you need? How can I care for you? My old refrain, I love so much. How can I be kind to myself in this moment?
dropping in that magical question moment by moment when we remember how can I be kind to myself in this moment? And then listening noticing what arises. Judgments, perhaps. Can we breathe them with tenderness and care? Oh, this is the moment of suffering. Turning to the body. Ending to the heart and the gut. Embracing, allowing. Removing the object, removing the story, and resting into the felt experience of joy or dukkha or whatever is here. Now, moment by moment. Resting and opening. Resting and opening. Allowing the sound of practice to permeate the moments through presence and love. Got you. I'm here for you. We might offer ourselves finding your own way to access your own love for yourself. Nothing perfect. That's not the goal. Rather, we can come to recognize these things as they are and learn to embrace them, be with them, and care for ourselves amidst reality, present moment, ever-changing, 
reality. Oh, Recognizing and embracing reality. Ah, it's like this.
Back to repair right now. Offering ourselves our kind attention. Letting go of our notions that this moment should be other than it is. Allowing the bells to call you home. Allowing body to rest. To be held by the earth. Allowing the body to receive the embrace, the hug, the gravity of Mother Earth herself.
to that experience of rest. Maybe you can't feel the body resting, that's okay. Don't listen to me right now. If you can, feeling the body rest. Allowing your heart and mind to have that experience that precious experience of resting. When we notice the absence of rest or the opposite of rest, agitation and something else, we can greet them with the same tender, gentle awareness. Ah, this is how agitation feels in the body right now for anger, frustration, despair, whatever might be present. My opponent does not care what it is my fault. Tuning to ourselves as we are ever changing. Resting, resting in the field of rest.
Resting. Receiving. Allowing embracing Savoring five more minutes together. Moving in to the beginning of shallow experience of rest. Letting yourself just be for a change. However it is that you are, it's okay. Cultivating our ability to be here with ourselves, for ourselves. I got you.
I'm here for you. I'm asking that magic question. How can I be kind to myself? In this moment, With the same sense of openness and receptivity, the curiosity of kindness, tuning into the body, noticing, recognizing how we might be kind to the body as we gradually expand the field of awareness to include movement. And after you've enjoyed some movement, the body's got a little wakefulness, adding in light and sight, noticing what you see. And how the heart, mind, and body respond to that which is seen. Perhaps a little self massage or some smaller big stretches. Actively caring for yourself. It's a radical act. It's not what society is encouraging us to do. There are a few things on my mind that I wanted to talk about tonight. The first is basically Duca. You know, shit just sucks sometimes, right? That's, that's how it is. There's, it's not an accident that Asadaka Katama awakened and became the enlightened one in Buddha, that he offered these four noble truths. And the first of those four noble truths was dukkha, or is dukkha. Often translated as unsatisfactoriness or stress or discontent. Sometimes, Dukkha is offered as life is suffering. And sometimes it's offered as like there is suffering in life, but we're not getting caught in the, the subtleties of whether those are different things or not. It's one word, Dukkha. And if you've been born on this earth, it's part of your experience. And I think that one of the hardest things to remember is that personal. It's not happening to us. It's not happening because we just something wrong. It's not happening because we're in trouble and something's bad at us. Life is hard sometimes. We can't avoid it. Okay. And if we spend our lives 
trying to avoid the suffering, like trying to not suffer. And then there's this subtle or not so subtle way that I've, in my experience anyway, you, you all get to tell me after a bit when I finish talking. But as I try to avoid the suffering, I try to avoid the suffering, I try to avoid it, I try to avoid the suffering, and I can't, I think that I'm failing. There's like this extra layer of another thing I've done wrong. Right, so that like this first thing that I did wrong, that's why I'm suffering, and then I'm, like trying to avoid it, and I can't avoid it. So like clearly, I'm doing the avoiding wrong too, right? I'm failing. What if, what if we saw through that nonsense and we saw that through that delusion and recognize, oh, ooh, oh, this is a moment of suffering. And even just right now, as we're sitting here, however you're sitting, listening to me, thinking, whatever's going on, tuning me out, it all, it's all good. What happens if you just stop for a second and tune in? Oh. Oh, this is the moment of suffering. What if for just a second you stopped? Trying to make things the way you wanted them to be. Stop fighting this tumult of atrocities. Racism, sexism, homophobia, homophobia transphobia, climate disaster, economic collapse, war, famine, poverty, classism. The list goes on. So what if for a moment we could be like, oh, 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 this is a moment of suffering. Joblessness, underemployment, homelessness, Addiction, incarceration. Oh. And we let our hearts crack open to the reality of the suffering. When we're strong enough to do that or courageous or resilient enough to do that, I find that what comes up when I can actually stop and be like, oh, this is so funny. Well, I care about the suffering. You know, my personal suffering, this global suffering, urban suffering, universal suffering, San Francisco suffering, whatever. <clears throat> the suffering of the delusion of white supremacy, right? all the sufferings. And I can recognize, oh, this is a moment of suffering. There arises, tenderness arises, compassion arises through presence, through awareness, through allowing. Not because I'm like trying to be kind and gentle and tender, to trying to be compassionate, trying to be generous. But because I'm actively actually touching into what's here. Oh. And when I'm not strong enough, when there's not enough resilience and I touch into the suffering, when I am not actually able to be present with it, 
and I feel like I get overwhelmed and knocked over by it, and then there's more suffering. When that happens, I practice, and I encourage you to practice resourcing yourselves. Picking up your dog or your cat, getting some love, tending to a plant. You think the cage takes care of these plants just 100% from altruism? I mean, she's a beautiful, generous human. And when you give to something and it shines, it's nourishing. Right? When you nourish something, you're nourished by it. And I don't want to go too far on tangent, but you know, I love my tangents. But there was a study that I became aware of in 2006, so predated 2006, where people who were living in an assisted living community at different levels of care, and they, I don't know, let's say it was 50 people, I don't know, they gave half the people, they gave up from plants, and half of the people, they said, Ooh, here's this plant, someone else is going to care for it and take care of it, we're just going to put it on your window, so there you go. And half of them, they said, here's a plant for you to care for and tend to. And let me tell you, at the end of six months or whatever, I don't know how often they checked in with people, the plant and the person were doing much better in this other side where there was this agency and attending to and a caring for and encouragement of investigation. And the plant and the person were doing not as well, not that they've declined, I don't really know, but like relative to one another. Not as well when they were just, oh, here's this plant. Someone else is going to take care of it, right? And I feel like there's a messaging, maybe subtle, maybe kind of more overt sometimes, that someone else out there is going to take care of it. Wow, I tell you, I wish that was true. <laughs> ah. and I you know that might be true like a, a bigger universal higher power greater power God kind of thing but I hear that message I think a lot of us hear that message as like some other human being is going to take care of it a parent a lover the government, our child, our friends. And in my experience, it like sets us up for disaster and disappointment and a lot of finger pointing. Why didn't you? You didn't, you should have, you could have, why didn't you? But guess what? They're all just other fucked up humans trying to survive this shit show. Like they're doing the best that they can, just as I am doing the best that I can at every moment. And sometimes I fall flat on my face and sometimes I get up and sometimes I'm really skillful and sometimes I'm really unskillful. And it's like, oh, you know, can we be with the complexity of it? There's an insight teacher here in the Bay Area who says, we are not our fault or you are not your fault, right? It's a culmination of causes and conditions that led to this moment. Just like, try that on for a minute. You are not your fault. Is there a kind of a bristling? Is there a softening? Is there a settling? Right, so there's to go, there's unsatisfactoriness. And what happens when we show up for it, when we say, oh, this is a moment of suffering. I'm here for you. I got you. I got you. What's that? What is that that you're saying? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I've neglected you. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. And we commit to grow and listen and attune. How can I care for you in this moment? How can I be kind to you in this moment? What do I need? A hug. Okay, so we ask for a hug. Or we give ourselves a hug. 
No. A walk, a bath, a shower, take care of a plant or another bee. Meal, some chapstick, wash your face, some water, exercise, rest. A bath, did I say bath? You know, we've had all this water recently, so we're going to take a bath right now. Mm. Right, so there's dukkha. When we can just like, oh, there's dukkha. There's the possibility to rise up to meet it, to care for it, to tend to it, and have some freedom from this idea that it's a punishment, right? That we've done something wrong, and some freedom from this idea that like, oh, I can't escape the dukkha. I'm failing again, like that second piece of it. And in that mix, it can be really helpful to recognize that there are things inside and outside of our control. You know, it's been my experience that I, I can't control anyone else or anything else or any of that. And I forget all the time, but sometimes I remember, you know. And I also cannot control the emotions that arise or the thoughts that arise. They're conditioned, and I can take action in the present moment to condition what the next thoughts or emotions are. But that one that just came up, I can't do anything about that. It happened due to these other causes and conditions from the past. And sometimes, unfortunately, sometimes I don't even have control over the next action. It just comes so fast. I'm going too fast. And sometimes when I slow my roll, it's like, oh, that's where I have some agency. What's the next action? And for me, more and more and more and more and more and more and more, I recognize, I see, oh, that skillful next action. What's that skillful next action? That's a little bit of tenderness and care and gentleness, compassion, awareness, attunement in this direction. You know, like back here at me, because I'm suffering. Dukkha, right? Like it's how it is. We're in this human condition, human experience. And I love to go around blaming capitalism. And I feel grateful that I'm seeing through that a little bit more clearly as I have friends who grew up in socialist environments. And some of that's just fucked up too. It's like, oh, maybe the problem is greed. And it just manifests in different forms. And we're all doing the best that we can. And some of us doing the best that we can, we're still doing really shitty, right? I do really shitty in some moments, you know? We're human. And when I'm not going around blaming, whether it's capitalism or the government or a person, then I have more energy to attend to like, oh, what's going on, girl? How can I be kind to myself in this moment? How do I care for this? This moment of suffering, this this human experience. Mm. And... When I can care for that, I more clearly see where I have agency. You know, where, when, and how it's time to speak up. How to communicate with my voice, or my words, or my actions. No. Or yes, or more, or less, or whatever the request is. but I get to say what I mean and mean what I say and not say it mean. Like, and maybe I get hurt and I don't create more mess because I've taken care of myself as best I could at the moment. Or I've asked for help, right? You know, sometimes we need a lifeline. Not expect to do all this on our own or by ourselves. We can call on a higher power. We can call on other people. We can call on Dhamma. We can call on our practice. I find that the 
their path of acceptance is really important. And I think that sometimes people get confused by that. They can think that means they have to accept um, unacceptable behavior. And for me, what it means is like learning to accept this moment as it is. Like, oh, it's like this. Oh, and then how do I take care of myself? Given this, given this emotional response, given this interaction that just occurred, given this interaction that occurred a thousand years ago that still torturing me, like, oh yes, I accept. I accept myself as I am in this moment, totally and completely imperfect, perfectly human, except, oh, hi. And then when I settle into that, there's like this ground that shows up underneath me. And then I have the capacity and the courage and the energy to get out there and do and say what needs to be said, to say no. Or say yes, or make an offer and listen, make a request. Stand up, show up. And to notice when maybe I'm doing too much, right? Listen, keep listening in, slowing down enough that I can listen in and tend. So it's this balance and I'll close with something that's very alive for me in this whole mix of things is that I often really want a prescription or a recipe. Like if you do this, you'll get this. If you're having this, do that. You know, this kind of, I don't know, whatever, definitive thing. But my experience has been that it doesn't work like that because I'm always changing and the moment is always changing. So this other path of checking in and tuning in and, oh, how are you doing? What's going on? Like taking time, five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour, whatever, for meditation to cultivate presence so that I can attune, so that I can give myself kind attention and take care so that the wise action can emerge knowing that that wise action might be different in any moment in time because each moment's different. And you're always different. You know, you're always changing. I'm always changing. And we forget because we're right there with ourselves the whole time, right? So we forget. But if you have a photograph from not that long ago, they can help you remember. And if you have a photograph from longer ago, it's even clearer. But each moment, you're a different person. Yeah, maybe that's enough for tonight. Thanks for listening.